Hey, NBA Hopefuls. Welcome to NBA Waves. You're live on the air. And today we are connecting with QS, who is here to share with us the importance of connecting with school reps at NBA and Masters Fairs. As always, my name is Eric Lucrezia, and I am joined by my two co-hosts, Barris Apir and Kritika Srinivasan. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi, everyone. Hey, everybody. And I'd like to introduce our two guests for today's episode, Ben Webb and Kaylin Rickos. I'm probably mispronouncing your name, but why don't you guys each introduce yourselves real quick? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll kick it off. Uh, Eric and, and team, thanks for thanks for having us here. We really appreciate it. Um, hi, everybody out there, um, all the hopefuls for the, the MBA world. My name is Ben Webb. I'm the head of client partnerships here at QS, um, working with hundreds of universities across the United States and California um, or and uh, Canada, helping them kind of connect to you, find resources um, to be able to learn more about what universities has to offer you, um, what programs are the best fit, so on and so forth. Um, before my life here at QS, um, it's good to note, um, I was on the other side of the table that you're looking to sit at. I, I spent some time at Carnegie Mellon at the Tepper School of Business in their admissions office. Um, prior to that, I was at Penn State University main campus, um, working in the Smeal College of Business, doing their master programs and recruiting for their MBAs. So uh, a lot of the things we're going to talk about today, I, I lived up until recently until I came this side of the house. So real excited to be getting back into this side here with Eric and the team and, and getting to have those conversations. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. And Kaylin, welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Kaylin Ricos. I'm QS Regional Director for the West Coast, working with universities all throughout the West Coast. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you for inviting us to come. For QS, before I came to QS, I actually supported over 100 universities globally in 30 different countries, including the United States, recruiting students um, from all over the world but also helping students really get opportunities at those universities and working in those fairs globally and in the United States. So I'm very excited to kind of bring my expertise and have these discussions with you guys. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Kaylin. And I'm super excited to hear what you guys have to say because I've known QS for it's about a decade now of as a former director of recruitment. I've attended so many fairs you guys produce all around the world. You guys do some great work. So um, why don't we start off by you telling us a little about QS, like maybe start with history. Um, you know, you guys have been in the industry for a long time now, providing MBA and master's fairs for schools and students to connect for a real long time now. So tell us about QS. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Eric. I'll, I'll jump in here. And I mean, I think you hit it right on the head, right? When people think of QS, they really um, start to think about the rankings, right? The largest global ranking out there and our amazing MBA and, and master's events. But I mean, QS is really a, so much larger than that. I mean, we started over 30 years ago with the events and, and getting access for students to be able to, to meet these universities from different parts of the world, different parts of the region that they necessarily couldn't get themselves to. But really at the heart of QS, um, I mean, we're truly a data-led insights company. Right? And our specialization is helping universities evaluate and understand their global reputation, how to leverage those things to be able to help diversify their student recruitment strategies, but also getting students to those universities as well. Right, As much as we're looking to help universities diversify their recruitment and their population on campus, we're also looking to help get those students diversified in what's out there in the world. Where do they want to study? What do they want to study? How can they get there um, and really educate? Our, our mission here is to educate as many people as we can about options, universities, destinations, career outcomes, and things like that. So I, I think from a, a university side, I mean, there's there's two big things that we have going on here at QS lately that I, I think are, are worth mentioning, and they'll, they'll kind of roll into the student search process as well. I think one of them is our, our, our student insight tracker has been coming out for the universities. It's the largest um, international student survey in the world. Over 264,000 students have filled this survey out. And what we're looking to do is figure out how can we better service students in various countries. So we go through a survey of asking questions of what are they most concerned about? Um, what are the top driving factors that they want to go to a university for? So we can help educate these schools on what do you need to improve as a university? What do you need to be able to communicate and talk with about these students that makes them feel comfortable traveling from maybe the, the UK or Africa or India and coming to the US or coming to Canada where they may have only ever seen it in movies, right? They've never visited, never traveled. So building up that, that repository of information and helping universities be able to communicate with these students has been a big thing um, that, we've, that we've really taken a champion of. Um, but also we have three major aggregator websites for students to do research on, whether it's topuniversities.com, topmba.com, or even in China, our QS China website, I mean, over 70 million unique students are on that website. 
searching for universities, getting to link up with them, seeing if their qualifications, see virtual tours, videos, what events they're going to be at. So really good resource and really robustly building that out and adding universities profiles information to help get these students to, again, find out as much as they can through the virtual screen before they uh, come out either to an event or, or pay for that ticket to come visit in, in person. And lastly, the big the big thing is rankings is a big conversation, right? You, you started off with QS and we went right into talking about how hey, we're associated with the rankings. But there's there's this big movement right now about students that they get care more about than just a ranking, right? They want to know, is this university good at teaching? Do they have a good career placement opportunity? How inclusive are they? What's their student faculty look like? And QS has built out our QS stars rating, which is a rating from one to five plus where we're actually taking what students are telling us they value in their, their search for university and we're rating the universities on it. And there's no bias, right? It's not an opinion of other universities about a university. We're literally audit auditing this university and saying, how many cafeterias do you have, right? How many gyms are on campus? What do your facilities look like? What is your PhD percentage of your faculty are here? Your international student um, faculty or your student ratio, but also your faculty ratio. So we're enabling a student to now come and say, I'm not gonna build my search list by number one through five in the United States. I'm looking at a student come in and say, I'm really worried that I wanna be at an inclusive school. I'm really worried about graduation placement. I wanna make sure it has good facilities. What are the best places for me to go that those three things I care about matter? Um, so we've really been, been taking that to market and championing the, the student qualifications in that area. So those are kind of some of the big things that we have going on here at QS. Obviously, still running over 150 events around the world in person to connect our students, but really trying to find more unique ways um, to get these students educated and connected. That's that was really good. I mean, you have, sorry, it's just like, I mean, so many different data points. And with so many schools out there, it's hard to know where to start, especially when you're like, you know, 16, 17, 18, you don't really know what's going on. Yeah. And it sounds like you really updated a lot of the kind of criteria or what's important to the next generation of students, which is really, really yeah. good. Yeah, we're trying. <laughs> I have a question about one of the one of the this catch word that you said that um I would love for you to just like fan it out so I can understand it better better you said you you do work with diversity recruitment strategies right this this notion so I'm curious what what does that look like is that the fairs I mean it seems like you're an amazing conduit between the university and the student but can you give some examples of the this diversity recruitment strategy yeah, so it's, it, it's really it's the diversifying their recruitment strategy, right? I think that we, we've seen what happened post COVID and kind of what we used to do and how we would recruit. There, there was a there was a pattern, right? There, there was almost a stamp. You could put it on it. You hit these target source markets. That's where you go. You get these students, right? We know we're going to get ten percent of our Indian candidates. We're we're going to build ten percent of our Chinese candidates right here and there. And it was kind of a process that you follow. And these are the areas that you go to. And now universities reputations and and the value we're putting on the experience in the classroom has driven a lot of people that we want more global diversity right we want an educational experience and, and that in, in diversity and diversifying your your programs at university means a lot of different things right um whether it's race whether it's religion but it's also the value of an mba is the people to your left and right right i mean accounting doesn't change whoever's teaching it. the person that's teaching it might but accounting is accounting the people you surround yourself with their mindset how they view things how they view the world how they bring that experience in that's what we're looking for. And that's the value of diversifying that recruitment strategy, because you might be going to a market like Kazakhstan, or you might be going down to Brazil, where you've, your university has never entered into this market, which means your classroom and your alumni and your students have never had that exposure to that mindset, to that thought process. So we're really trying to help students are, and universities understand, hey, you're, you may have a really strong reputation in these four factors. And that means a lot to a lot of people in a part of the world you've never existed in. So how can we help get you there? How can we get, get exposure for you, but also match those students up and see that there's value to be able to talk to your university um, and attend there. So that's kind of what we're, we're looking at right now. And okay, if you want to jump in anything on that from, from the diversify the recruitment strategy. Yeah, no, just to jump in a little bit. So I did actually spend time, I lived a little bit in Kazakhstan helping students from these diverse markets. And there is really a power to what's going on over there and going on in these newer markets. And like Ben said, I think as a student, an MBA is also a lot of networking. Who are you sitting next to? Who are you being able to have those conversations with? And it opens up opportunities. That's actually pretty much what happened to me is something that I never thought was gonna happen because of someone I knew and knew through higher education 
brought me out to living in Thailand for four years. So you never know what's going to happen. And it was the best four years. So I think this diversification is something that's not only going to grow the university and their reputation, but also the opportunities as a student that's going there. I'm curious. Oh, oh sorry, Kritika, go ahead. I love what I'm hearing, uh, Ben and Kaylin. Uh, you know, especially, um, so I should say, like, first, I'm a big fan of the QS guides, especially to the different country guides that he posts. Uh, for someone who doesn't know Canada and doesn't know how cold it gets, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it really looks so helpful. Um, and I always point it as one resource um, to have everything put out right there. Um, so one thing is we all know QS does a lot of fairs. Uh, how has that changed post the pandemic? Are you guys doing, I know you yourself said that you're doing a lot of events. Are you guys looking at still continuing with the virtual events or it's only the um, the offline events that are happening? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely been a crazy roller coaster, right? I think up until this this last year, we, we thought we were good and we were safe and we were going to get, get back in person. Then another variant came out, right? So, so things have, have definitely changed as far as the fairs go. And I think the big theme here for QS as we have kind of looked at our, our opportunities has been access, right? Access for students to universities. And we, we went really heavy, like a lot of places did into the virtual events here during the COVID times. And we really start to see a change in, in students' behavior and university behavior, right? So um, many things have changed. We're, the virtual really started to kind of slow down here in the, in the past 12 to 18 months. Um, and a return to in-person has, has really come back with a vengeance and really strong. But what that's done is really start to split the market too. So from a university standpoint, right, we statistically are starting to see that students who are attending the virtual fairs are more a year plus out. They're kind of, maybe they're, they're a, a junior in college or mechanical engineer. And they're like, I do not want to do CAD for the rest of my life, right? I, I want to get into that consulting thing they got going over there. How do I get into tech consulting, right? A MIM program, a one-year early career MBA might be the route I want to go. So we're starting to see those searchers explore what can I do post-degree. And we're seeing a lot of that searching being done virtually because they can get on the list, see 60 universities do a virtual event. They're on the mailing list right now. Um, and they're getting to gather that information. Um, where now we're starting to see those in-person events are, they're looking a year or less, potentially three months within the application, applying for round two, round three, the next rounds. So we've really started to see kind of a shift in, in students of how am I acquiring information now that these virtual events are there versus maybe going to an info session, so on and so forth. So things have definitely been, um, been different for us as far as we kind of come out of the pandemic and on what we deliver and how we deliver it. But we've seen a very strong demand of getting back to in-person because you can't beat shaking a person's hand, looking them in the face, right? And, and showing that passion that you have for your university and vice versa. You as a student coming expertly prepared and passionate and you know the mascot and you know the campus and I want to eat at this place, this part of the, the, the campus is my visit, right? That's, that's the value. That's the factor that you sometimes can't really portray virtually. And that's what we look for when we go to those fairs, right? I mean, that, that person that I'm going to remember when I, when I go to that fair and there's a couple hundred people in there, I remember the person that came with that passion, that excitement. So we're really kind of trying to find that balance because the one thing we don't want to stop is the accessibility for students to be able to get to these universities virtually, but also knowing that there is that that still fill that we need to get some really quality information to students in a, in a very short amount of time to find out if this is the right place I want to study. So we're really balancing um, the types of events that we're hosting. And um, there's also been some changes about how we're doing and running those events. So yeah. Have you noticed yet if the numbers have changed with all the layoffs in the tech in the tech world? Have you noticed anything? Yeah, the tech that? that, that's been crazy. Uh, I don't have any hard data on it. I mean, obviously, there's there's been a, a ton of of layoffs happening in there. Um, we our West Coast swing happened right right when those were going on, so we saw some of the increase in the push. Mm -hmm. um, a lot, I don't know where a lot of those people went. I'm assuming they probably took a couple of day, days off to reset their brain. Totally. But um, we're anticipating them to be scooped up pretty fast. Um, most that we're probably looking are already in the funnels for most. But I think we'll definitely see a little wave come in before they before they all get picked back up. It's pretty good insights what you gave about the two different kind of event formats. I mean, I think the two kind of have to be complementary. And yeah. like, yeah, while there's definitely things you can gain and maybe even certain advantages to an online event, maybe you can like breeze through more quickly, more efficiently, but the depth to which you can go. Like, it's pretty cool to see you, Ben, on the, on the screen right now, but it was definitely more fun at the, at the networking cocktail after the event in New York yeah. <laughs> like last month. 
you know, it's, it's a different kind of thing. Um, and I also wondered, like, when you were describing how people who come in person tend to be, like, less than a year, six months, or even three months out for an application versus the online tend to be, you know, further out in their search. Do you think it's a question of urgency that people uh, who are like, oh, man, I better get on this now, and they're, they're really motivated to go on site? or Yeah, I think it's a mix of both. I mean, I think that if you're willing to get on a – take a Saturday, get on a train, go to Mid Midtown Manhattan, right? And whether the storm would get into that place, right? You're a pretty qualified student. Like you're, you're there because you want to learn about these programs. You want to make sure that there are, you're going to pay an application fee of 50 to $250, $1,000, right? You want to make sure that money is well spent. So I think there is a little bit of urgency of some people from the tech layoffs might've said, oh boy, I, I need to get working on this right now. So they're getting down there. They're not waiting for the virtual. They want to ensure that they can have that communication. They can want to ensure that they can have those type of conversations. So I think there's a little bit more of the urgency, but it's also a little bit that they know and also value the information that they're going to get while being in person versus saying, OK, I might get into a virtual room and, and maybe there's six or seven other people with me or or just typing through a chat isn't really what I want to get to. Um, you don't want to risk it. Right. Um, so I think that it, it also shows a little bit more to the universities that, hey, I'm, I'm here. I took the time out of my day, my life to come out here and chat with you. Um, and not that that universities track like right touch points and things, but I mean, it definitely makes it more memorable than a, than a name and a screen that usually ends up into a comp flow. So I think there is a there is a little bit more to say about those, but it also kind of it goes right back to the data, right? It tells us that those students might still be kind of surfing various levels of of interest on those virtual events that you can jump on during a lunch session or or what you have versus those that are taking that that real person time to come down and see people. So I think it's a it's a little bit of all of it. And Kayla, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I, I definitely just want to add a piece that I think what you guys are kind of really saying is virtual is really building those knowledge blocks, that foundation of understanding where you want to go and what is your next step. Um, and that's why I think a lot of our data is pushing. It's more students who are just interested to know. They want to find those conversations. And I think a lot of times they don't have the confidence yet to go to a rep and start asking them questions. So it's an opportunity for them to get those questions that they have answered virtually. But in person, I think one of the biggest things to get out of in person is it's your first impression and actually showing up shows immediately the representative that you're more prepared and you're more excited to go into the next direction for those phases. So there's definitely a difference on the students that go there. But I will also say it's somewhere that you should do both. Um, build those foundations, those knowledge blocks virtually, but also take advantage of in person. Yeah, and I think it's also worth saying, like those of those of you that are listening, going, "Oh my goodness, I need to, I need to find an event, I need to get there, I need to talk to these people. I'm not going to get accepted, right?" I mean, it, it's just, a, it's a touch point out there. And, and also, know for those of you that are saying, like, "Well, I'm also looking at a very niche specific area, things like that." So for QS, right, we run STEM summits. So we we have a population, right? They're too big to run in person, right? We want we want to grab a whole part of the market and get everybody who's in Latin America interested in STEM summits. So we want to connect you to the best. 60 universities that offer STEM degrees, right? That that still has the value there, right? So we're we're also trying to make sure that we're meeting you where you are as a student, right? If, if you're coming to coming to an event in in Washington D.C. or whatever, and you're really looking for STEM's all you want to get into, right? Maybe th those that might be a better fit for you. So don't think like, oh my goodness, they only do STEM summits or what have you online. Am I missing out by not going in person? There, there's a match that, right? You're going to see some of these STEM schools at the in-person ones, but if you want to see a mass, you can you just get online and you can see them. Um, and see a vast majority of them. And kind of, Erica, you said, it allows you to kind of peruse through without talking to people. You can go and download brochures. You can watch their videos, their marketing, and you can follow up with them afterwards. So there's there's definitely different features that we've added through through that. Uh, and, and the STEM summits, I think, is just one of those. But um, don't think if you're sitting out there going, oh, my goodness, I'm not going to get into a school because I haven't gone to a fair. Going to a fair definitely can help that conversation, meet that face-to-face, -face, especially when you get to the interview stage. It's a lot easier to do that interview when you know that you've met that face before on the other side of the table um, than if you're going in there cold, right? If you get to select your interviewer and things like that, all of these are little things. You being a little bit more relaxed, showing a little bit more stress, you're more comfortable telling your story. Um, we, we seem like scary people over there, but I mean, we're, our goal is to enroll you, right? Or there, my old goal would be to enroll you. We're in the business of wanting you to come to school and not scaring you away. And anything that we can do, and sometimes these events help alleviate that stress, um, via the networking fairs and, and the experience you'll get afterwards as well. It's a really good point, Ben. Like a, a fair is often an opportunity to practice things like networking, practice giving your elevator pitch. But I also think you shouldn't go into it cold. You want to kind of practice these things a little bit beforehand yeah. as well to have that 
to make that good impression, first impression on school reps, alum, whatever it may be. But you did say something that caught my attention when you were like, oh, it's, you know, you're not going to get rejected from the, your application to whatever school because you didn't attend a fair. That's not the case. However, it should be noted that a lot of schools do require that you attend one of their own events, one of their school events, whether it's in person, online. They want to know that you've gone deep in your research. They want to know that you've taken the time to either have a Zoom or a phone call with an alum, that you showed up at a coffee chat, that you did any kind of virtual networking event. They just want to be sure that you know what you're getting into, that you're going to be a happy customer, actually, at the end of the day. You might have a great GMAT and so on, but if you didn't bother to go deep in the research and figure out if this school is the right fit for you, you may not be happy there, and you're going to be kind of a problem for them. So it's 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 about... Uh, it's, it's about making those connections and so on. But absolutely right. You won't be penalized for not attending a fair. Yeah. Perhaps if I you to add a point. I want to add a point here, especially for the international travelers. And I mean, the aspirants and also people, say, for example, who are looking at a West Coast school, but are all on the East Coast and things like that. I would say these MBA fairs are like a boon to them because you, it's kind of like you get to date before you actually marry. Yeah. Uh, so that you can, you know, you can get to see like, you know, how do you feel? And I, I would say it's almost like a little bit of speed dating. But then, of course, you do get a chance to um, to showcase yourself and uh, go ahead for it. So can you tell us like some of the cool features that you have for these events? Anything that stood out, which is yeah. so unique to QS events? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll take this one, too. But I think a good thing you just said there is also like, as you as a student out there, do not think that just because you're going to like an East Coast school event that there's not going to be West Coast schools and people from all over the place, right? These events have universities from all over the world are going to be there, from France, from the UK, from, from Ireland, from all over are going to be at these. So it's kind of like the, people get stuck thinking, if I go to an East Coast school, I can only work on the East Coast. That, that's not true at all. And that's the same for these events. You're going to have uh, universities from everywhere. And that really rolls into kind of what's what's been new with us. I mean, we've as COVID's come through, and as you can see in the data, especially in the B-School world, right? I mean, options are what students want. They might come in thinking, okay, I want uh, I want to study finance. Well, how do you want to study finance? Where it used to be grad school events were broken out to only grad programs for master programs and MBAs were separate. Where now for QS, we, we look to, again, increase the access for students um, by combining that. So now a student can come to a QS fair, they can walk in and you're going to see everybody. You're going to see financial engineering, financial accounting degrees, finance MBA concentrations. Um, so that's one of our biggest things here that we've been doing is really starting to consolidate those fairs that students can come and it's a one-stop shop. They can walk in, get to see various universities of various levels, various programs that they have offerings and talk to each one of those people to set and find out what is the best fit for where I want to go. Um, what is the program that's going to really get me what I want to do? So we're really looking to create that inclusive one-stop shop for the students um, that really represents their full portfolios. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other stuff is like the STEM summits have been a really big increase for us. The STEM market has been growing increasingly. New programs are getting STEM designated. Um, the OPT and things like that have become increasingly important. So making a place for them specifically to go to, to speak with universities has been a really big thing for us. Um, but ben, we also before you go on, I, I know a lot of people know what STEM means, right? These are programs that are connected to or rooted in science, technology, engineering, and math. But a lot of people might not know what OPT is. That's an American thing. And... Yeah, I can explain it, but I'll, I'll let you do it if you want. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's the the STEM designation of the degree allows you to have extra years for to apply for your H-1B visa. So if you go to a, a STEM designated degree, you get three years um, to be able to apply um, for your sponsorship, where if you're not, you get one. So it allows you a lot more time from an employer standpoint. Employee knows they get you for at least a minimum of three years. And I think you get four full choices to be able to put in. Um, for that visa versus getting that that two, I guess, while you're still in the program and then your, your year after to get placed. So having those STEM designation definitely helps increase international students' ability to be able to get employed post-degree. Um, so it's it's one of those those big factors of the, the emerging market where you're seeing uh, universities just last week grab their STEM designation for their MBA program up in, up in the New York system and stuff. So this is very American. So I would say not international students, but non-American students, right? Yeah. And how, there's OPT and CPT. And one of those things is how it gives you like the right to have an internship at work as an intern or even as a paid employee during usually that summer break. Often it's during yeah. that summer break uh, during a two-year MBA in the States. And mm -hmm. the other one, uh, I think CPT is the first one. And OPT is for uh, post MBA. And as you said, it could allow you to work for up to three years post. Yeah. Yeah. from a STEM-designated master's or MBA program. 
But yeah, it's, it's really important to know that if you're a non-American citizen looking to study in the U.S., a nest of designation can be a really great way to track you for being able to work in the States and potentially, you know, permanent residency or nationality in the future. Yeah. And the end goal of this, right, is is employment. So if I find the best one that, that helps you helps you achieve that goal. So you're gonna spend all that money in the US at a school, you might as well yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Salary, right? Right. So I wanna go ahead. Oh, I'm just gonna say I want to backtrack. Um, maybe I won't backtrack since my dog is barking so prof profusely. Why doesn't someone else pop in while this is going on? Yeah so I was like you know I was uh, I wanted to pitch in and say that for international students often the STEM designation becomes like a big deal and it is a deal breaker for many. So there are many programs that you really like, but they say that, hey, it lost its STEM designation. And one thing is that, you know, a program can lose its STEM designation in one year versus still having it. So that's why I feel that relying on rankings such as yours can help us understand like which one has a STEM and which doesn't and so on. Yeah. Uh, so in that in that vein, like, you know, and um, how do you think students can get the best advantage of these events? What should they do? Yeah, definitely. I can take that one. So taking advantage of is, first of all, actually showing up. Um, I think a lot of times students will register for events um, and then not show up. And I think right there, it sets a ground for whoever you're going to be meeting that, yes, you registered, but you also took the step of showing up and showing up prepared as well. Um, I think a lot of us during COVID got a little too used to wearing our PJs to work. Um, so I actually had a lot of um, universities talking about how a lot of students were not wearing kind of the attire that they used to pre-COVID. So I think being able to show up and being a little bit more well-prepared than the next student over is just the first impression. Um, and first impressions mean everything at these events and being able to talk to them um, and taking advantage of speaking with them, being prepared. I think Ben talked about knowing the mascot at the university. Um, we always present the universities that are gonna be attending the fairs before the fair begins. So you are able to do that research and it doesn't take long to do that research either. Um, and take a look at other universities that you might not be originally attending to speak with because you never know what's gonna happen. Um, there might be a university you're attending to speak with who is busy. Um, but then you see one table that they have a free opening and you go and sit with them. And because you did a little extra research, you already knew a little bit about them, but then you get to discover a little bit more. Um, and just because you had that base knowledge really sets you apart from the rest, but also taking advantage. So at our fairs, we do have panels before the fair begins. We have presentations that happen. So are you taking advantage of those? Are you coming for those? Uh, because a lot of the panels will have the directors and deans of those institutions actually participating in the panels, but they don't stay for the fair. So you get an opportunity to speak with them after the panel that you may not be able to speak with them at the fair. So I think it's a really great advantage to have there and have the confidence and the key to stand up and have those conversations. Um, and then we do have headshots. So take your headshot, take advantage of those. So it really is being well prepared and taking advantage of the opportunity. And I think it's the full opportunity too, yeah. right? I mean, there, there's the there's the part that you're getting to meet the deans, you're getting to meet the students, or the, the staff members, you're getting the panels. But it, I mean, there's a whole field of people that are there, right? Whether it's gonna be test prep centers, consultant yeah. organizations, like if you have no idea where to get a headshot, right? This is your chance to get your, your free LinkedIn headshot and get those stuff done. So, I mean, it, it's really showing up and getting those things because if you get to those events, right? And you get a free resume review or you get a free mock interview. I mean, that's that's a value in itself. So, I mean, showing up there, there's a value to it versus just getting your name on that list. So I think those are all great things to, to take away. And it's also networking with other students who are there. Um, I've seen many times that they all meet up afterwards and start talking because they were talking at the same university at the same time and they had a lot of things in, in, um, combined together, a lot of things that they have interest in. And so getting to meet those other students, it kind of makes you a little bit more calm, I think, when you're making a, de a decision like this of what university to go to. It also reminds me, like you were talking about, if you're stressed out and you're going to these events, having those secondary or tertiary 
programs that you've done a little bit of research on, there's this thing called exposure therapy. And if you expose yourself to an experience again and again, it just takes away that intensity and that that um, that anxiety. So it really gives you an opportunity not just to learn something new about the schools, but also learn about yourself and just assuage some of the, the jitters that are there because interviewing and networking is such a big part of the business school experience. And so having that with peers as well as colleagues, as well as the schools, as well as QS folks, like it just gives you a variety of people in the ecosystem to to practice with, right? 100%. I mean, just like an MBA program is not just, you know, learning about finance and doing spreadsheets. It's very much about the people that you're studying with. And so are these fairs. The way to get the most out of them is to engage with the people there. And, you know, there's a lot of people who might be nervous. There's introverts. There's people who just, you know, networking and, and someone is not comfortable for them. But this is a trainable skill. That's the good news. And these fairs are a perfect opportunity, opportunity to do that. Um, like one of you were saying, like, a lot of times people connect with other, you know, candidates at these events because you're going through the same thing. Could be a study buddy for the GMAT. Um, who knows? You might be future classmates together. And even if you go to different schools, you're both going to be out there, and, you know, graduated MBAs, hopefully working in, you know, maybe even the same company. So networking is always um, a powerful thing. I wanted to um, just talk about the fact that what I see a lot of times when I'm at these fairs, whether they're in person or online, you know, in person, sometimes you see the, the candidate who's a little bit shy to talk with people and just kind of goes around trick-or-treating, grabbing brochures. <laughs> Uh, or online even more so, where they're just like, they don't engage at all. There's not even a hello. They just like download the brochure from the virtual booth. There's no engagement. And this has become like a trend that I feel could be problematic. And I wonder if you, if you guys can comment on that. Yeah. I mean, so I think COVID introverted a lot of people. <laughs> I think we got used to not wanting to talk to anybody. Um, yeah. We definitely have seen it. I mean, you see it in the numbers, right? I mean, we, we, we've seen it where the people that are registering just want to get into the marketing flow. I mean, it, it's changed where it used to be, I'm going to I'm gonna pick up the phone, I'm going to call Eric at XYZ University, and I'm going to know nothing about you. I want you to educate me. Where now it's, these students are in these mailing lists, they're getting a ton of information, and they're saying, ooh, this is pretty interesting. Now I'm going to call Eric, and I'm going to ask him specific questions about things. So absorbing content a little bit more. But I think that for those of you that are out there that you're a little bit worried, you're, you're a little bit maybe shy, and you're, you're kind of wanting to gather that information. That, that, it, it's okay to a point, right? I mean, get that information and, and follow up with it because it's all about the follow up. But you're looking to go for an MBA, right? You're looking to become a future business leader of your of your country, of your sector. You got to put yourself out there. Um, and, and that's where a lot of these resources, right? These coaching and, and talking to these students and talking with alums and, and as, as uh we were saying before, I mean, that, that exposure therapy of doing a little bit of an interview with maybe a friend before you get there. I mean, that's why you're there. Always remember that. I mean, the, the chance is 90% of these people you're never going to see again. So you might as well go talk to them, right? And the ones that you do talk to, you're probably going to have a great conversation with, and you're going to follow up with it. So to, to those of you that are out there that might be a little bit worried of, of, well, what if I say the wrong thing, right? I mean, there's no dumb questions. I mean, that's literally why you're there is to ask all the questions you can. So you can be better informed on where to go because you might be able to get a chance to talk to a top five school and it's amazing and they have a great brand and this and that, but you might find out, well, it's actually not the best place for me to go to school based off what I want to study and where I want to go. So don't don't be afraid as you're, you're meandering on there. I mean, take these opportunities. That's what universities are looking for. That's what counselors are looking for. I mean, they, they're, they're there. They spent their time to come and speak to you. Have a shot. And one of those people might really break you open and have you talking to people for hours. And to build off that, what Ben said is they're there just as much as you are. So don't be afraid to talk to them because they're, they're there for a reason. They're not just coming to hang out in a city for the night. Um, so they're there to talk to you. So you know that they're they're perfectly okay with that and they're well aware of some students that may be a little nervous to talk to them. Um, that kind of bursts that bubble the second you have a, start to have a conversation with them. Um, so don't be afraid there, um, but also building off of what best you to go to an MBA, which means you really need to say why not there with these type of people in these universities. It's a great place to start um, and having those conversations. I want to throw in a cultural aspect here. So there are uh, people from certain um, industries and domains, for example, certain engineers who are so used to not speaking to their bosses or kind of like you know speaking to somebody else or like even interacting with the business folks because you're so isolated in their silos and in their departments 
for them going to such fairs gives them an idea of like what is even expected and what is a standard um you know in a certain business school and that also like so i always recommend people to attend such fairs so that they get an idea of like what does it take to actually get into b school yeah. um so yeah so along that lines i wanted to ask um like and i know that you know i've been, been to some of these fairs and i know that you know some students clamor to get the attention of certain business school reps and they're always like crowding at one of the tables so what do you think is one way to stand out from the crowd and uh, to speak with the reps yeah definitely to stand out like i said being prepared um i think when there's a certain look and confidence. Um, I think confidence is key here. And I know we were just talking about that kind of exposure therapy, but if you have that confidence to kind of step in and have that conversation, don't be afraid that if they're talking to someone else, waiting and ready to prepare and sit there the second they're done with one student and having that confidence to ask that first question. I think building off of what also you said is yeah, there's a cultural difference depending on what country you're from and what their expectations. But I think there's also a cultural difference from university to university. Um, so being able, typically a rep is a good representative of the culture and how that university works and being able to have those conversations with them that are more personable. I just wanted to touch on that. But really having that prep beforehand and if that's something that just stands out a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. I've had conversations with universities that really say, yeah, this person stood out because they were just prepared. They were well prepared. They had good confidence. Um, and also just kind of a secret in the background of what's going on is universities are able to take notes, say, hey, look, that, that student told me about this, this, and this. And these really are key, unique features of that student that really stood out to me. They note them. They, they take well aware of what's going on. And so when they follow up with you after, it's a more personal kind of message that you'll get from the university, which is always an amazing thing to have, something more personal than just a typical like cut, cut and paste email with you after as a follow up. So making sure that you're talking about those unique features and being a little bit more personable, they can look at your resume. So they already know what's on your resume. So what can make you stand out outside of the resume? Who are you as a student? Who are you as a candidate that can offer a little bit more? Um, I think that's always a big important part um, to have those discussions with those universities. Yeah, and if I, if I can, I mean, that's the whole topic we're talking about, right? Like, how do you stand out if you follow the process, right? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. a couple of years out, right? I mean, the average student usually starts looking about two years before they enter into a program. You get into those virtual situations, you talk to people like, like Eric and, and others that are out there and start to build that confidence, find that search platform, what you want to do. So when you get to this this point where you're at the fair, right? I mean, you just you just extrude this confidence of I know why I'm here, I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm looking. Now there's two areas there, right? Like there are gonna be those that we, we know exactly what I want, how I want to get it. I already did my research, I'm prepped. And there's another group of students who are like, I have no idea what I want to do. And, and I'm kind of searching, right? You're there grabbing that. And, and both of those types are are completely fine. But both of those also give off a, a, a presence to us as recruiters that says, all right, this person's probably one or two years out a little bit more. I can tell his questions are a little bit more superficial, just gathering his information. First, I, I, like, I distinctly remember, I mean, as I when I was on the other side of the table, like I was noting, I'm like, this person knew their stuff. They knew the 30 second elevator pitch. They fit into the class profile. They fit the culture that we're looking for. I need to find a way. I mean, I'm now working for him. It's like, I need to find a way to get this person to get into my university. I need to see what does he match for scholarship information? What can I invite him to personally, right? So I think it's this full circle of you got it's not a it's not a 20 minute decision, right? It's it's you're you're out there, you're starting to think, ah, the career I'm in right now, I really I'm not seeing the financial robust that I want to get to, the the roles that I'm in right now. I definitely feel like I'm not being challenged. You, you know that as a student or as a professional that's out there. You want to start doing that. So by the time, and maybe you're that, maybe you're both of those people. You're that person that's coming around in the, in the fall and you're gathering information and come spring, the next tour comes around, boom, now you're there, you're suit and tie, you're prepared, you're ready, you're at the panel, you're asking questions. So I, I think that's what it is. It's, it's we, we can tell that difference when we're there. And, and the more on point you are that fit exactly what we're looking for, the more we're going to remember you, right? And, and that's just the, the plain and simple of it. And neither of the, it's not, better or worse to be either of those people because those people are both at different sides of, of the story that they're looking at. 
But when it's time and you're looking to be a round one, round two applicant um, for a big time MBA program, being there prepared, showing the confidence, showing that you educated yourself, calling the university by the right name, right? <laughs> um, those, are the, those are the little things that like, I, can't, I can remember so many people who addressed cover letters and resumes to University of Pennsylvania versus Penn State, right? I mean, it's an immediate like, oh man, <laughs> like, like I hope this resume is looking really good. But I mean, it's the, it's those kind of things. So I, I think it's following the process. I mean, there's a method to the madness here for you to, to, to create a story of success, no matter what's your, what's your introvertness, your extrovert, your story. I mean, it's all going to boil down to it. That remind that, that brings to mind, um, you know, how Krithika was talking about it being like a dating situation. Mm -hmm. Like you get to see what they're like and they get to see what you're like. What are some of the ways that um, are great follow-up steps after the, the date itself, <laughs> you know, what do you recommend people do that's not going overboard, but is like a really classy way to, to respond to the people that you connected yeah. with? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's just a quick thank you. I mean, it's a show of appreciation. I mean, put something in there that, you know, you talked about with that rep. Um, I mean, that, that's really just the nice little classy, Hey, I mean, they're going to be busy. Right. I mean, I think it's just a, Hey, uh, thanks, Eric. It was great meeting you. Really enjoyed the conversation about the, the leadership office. Um, really looking forward to the next steps. Um, please keep me in mind for the information sessions that are coming up or opportunities to get to campus. I think just those, those kind of short and sweet things, the, the proactive to the person that you met if they have their business card. Um, but I mean, the next step really is, I mean, working yourself down that funnel, right? After you met them at the fair, you're intrigued, get to campus, get out, get in person. I mean, nothing beats living the shoes that you're about to be in. I mean, eat, eat the food, walk through the buildings, check out the town. Um, th that's the best follow up of saying, hey, I met Ben at a fair. I would love meeting those people. I met Ben at a fair. It was, it was great conversation. Now I'm here to see everybody else, right? Like that, that's the, the, the best follow up you can get in a person in the admissions world. So that's what I would say would be the two things. Kaylin, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with the making a little quick personal thank you. Um, I think you just have to switch and be like, in my shoes, what would I want? Do you want a university giving a very personal follow up email to me? Yeah, it just makes it that much better that you were paying attention. You were listening to what they had to say at the fair. Um, so it's definitely good to know when you just had a conversation, what are things that we can follow up and talk about? Um, but just doing something subtle like that and getting onto campus but also kind of then following the university on their social media platform, seeing what they're doing individually for fairs. Yeah, you just met them at one fair, but maybe you can meet someone else that is a different representative at a different fair, but going to see what specific events they're having, because a lot of universities then have events on their own campuses. So then seek out other opportunities to do there, because um, they are well aware. If, if you go to multiple events, they see the registration, they see your name, they see that you're being consistent and fi finding that information, partaking in webinars, um, just being active on that front is definitely something I would recommend. Yeah. Don't, don't be the person that shoots the, the mass email out to all the representatives asking for the fee waiver either, right? <laughs> I mean, I mean get, take, get, get into those conversations, right? I mean, I, I remember cringing of times of, Hi, Ben. Great to see you. What's the application fee waiver code? It's like, hey, man, that's a turn off. So like, yeah. know your know your presence as well. We're talking about things you should do. But I mean, that's one of the things probably not to do as well. Right. I mean, get yourself classified first, get some meetings um, and then those will come. Show but, your worth, right? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah right. So, you know, or asking for scholarships. I mean, a fee waiver, man, you're applying for an MBA. I'm talking about tens of thousands, if not more. You're worried about a hundred dollar, you know, but you know, it's for some people that can help, you know, and I get it, but you don't want to just like shop around trying to collect fee waivers. Same with the GMAT. Yeah. It's possible to get GMAT fee waivers. And if that's going to help you uh, in conjunction with other support, financial support, great. But you really want to, you know, tread lightly with scholarships. You don't want to like bring that up in the first moment, right? It's what you used to say. It's like asking for sex on the first date, right? Like there's certain <laughs> things you want to like, Build a relationship first and demonstrate your value, what you've contributed to the program, what you've done, what your goals are, and get them interested in you. And then you say, hey, but, which, by the way, the scholarship information is usually readily available on the website. Yeah. Exactly. So there's yeah. no need to even do that. And the second pitfall I would mention as a former recruiter is don't be like, what's your minimum GMAT score? Like, schools are not driven by minimum GMATs. First of all, it's usually averages, right? But it's so much more than that. 
the wall of GMAT is an important data point. I, I will not let Dara, Dara down by saying it isn't. Uh, it absolutely is, but also like the interview, the the essays, the references, all your experience and how you connect with people. Yeah. All of that is going to weigh in it, just as important, if not more. You know? I think that's like a super powerful message to Eric. Like you could be a 780 GMAT score, but if you walk into that room and you re misrepresent yourself, as a non-cultural fit, a person that's going to be disruptive in the classroom, a person that's not going to be a collaborator, and a person that doesn't represent the university brand, you're, you're not going to get admitted to that university because they're they're admitting you as a human to represent their school for the rest of yes. your life. And that is something that I think a lot of people say, I'm the I'm the smartest person in this room and they they deserve I deserve to be here. And that's a very wrong way to go it's about confidence. It's arrogance yeah. and nobody wants to yeah, be there. Right? Right? There's a fine line to that arrogance and confidence. And, I mean, I, I've seen it happen multiple times, right? I mean, people they that they're they're amazing on, on paper, but man, you just you are not the fit of what this university stands for. And we're really worried about what's what that culture is gonna happen in that classroom if we bring you in. So remember those things. It's good to have the scores, it's great to have the Fortune one hundred experience, but um be a be a good human, represent yourself in a good way, and, and that's gonna go a lot farther sometimes. Be a good human is always good advice. Like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be our tag you know the most commonly repeated word on every B school application is we want people who are nice and <laughs> not just yeah. we want happy people, happy people, yeah. less problems. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. You know. So, what other things that uh, you know QS does? I know that you guys do a lot in scholarships as well. Anything, anything changing towards there? Yeah, I mean, it's building out. We started the QS, um, the, the QS charity. Um, it was formalized, I think, about two years ago now. Um, we have some people really running that. There's various scholarships opportunities and pretty decent sized scholarships um, offered by um, by QS. They're, they're essay portions of them. I think we had four or five go out last year. Um, one of them went to my old my old university at Carnegie Mellon. I'm so excited about that. So um, there's there's definitely various scholarships you can have there. I mean, all the universities that are at the at the table and stuff, I mean, they're all offering scholarships as well. Um, so, I mean, there's, I mean, QS is here for you as a student, right? I mean, we are here to steward your your journey and introduce people to people like yourselves, uh, other test prep centers, other universities, um, but also financially, I mean, we're here to help steward that path. One of the, one of the big things is um, we did acquire um, a company called Student Apply, where now we're starting to have counselors um, at our events to help help coach up the resume, coach up the, con coach up the conversation, as Barr said, right, get some of that that uh, that stress of the conversation out of the way. Let's sit down at the table and have a chat. Um, so we're, there's a lot of new things coming up at at the QS world that can help support them, and it's it's supporting you mentally, monetarily, things like that. So um, we're we're more than just kind of providing a resource of events. We for some students, we're helping provide this experience and make it become a reality reality with ten thousand dollars scholarships, so on and so forth. So. Um, ben, how should people who are interested access student apply? So student apply specifically is very international. So any, I know we were touching base a little bit on international students, non-US citizens, and they, we have a website that's just student apply and looking up on that and there's local reps who are experts in specific locations. So experts in applying to the US, applying to the UK, applying to Europe, and it's really, I think what grown out of COVID is having everyone have access to this information and this knowledge. So a lot of it is based online, um, but we do have in country um, kind of support and counselors like Ben was saying. So they're, they're definitely easy to contact. Um, so you can just go to student apply our website and you'll be contacted with a consultant that can really just help you understand how to submit an application. How do you apply for scholarships? Um, it just really helps to bring that knowledge to everyone that has access to it. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. You can, you can get through it through the, the main um, QS websites as well, um, through the, the top universities and things like that. So, uh, or feel free to contact one of us um, and we'll get, you, we'll get you set up with it. But yeah, always growing, always moving, always thought forward. So um, we're here every step of the way for you. Feeling energized and inspired. Thanks, guys. <laughs> what we're here any, for. Any other? I mean, we're kind of winding down on the episode now. We're about 50, 51 minutes into it. Uh, any other final tips, suggestions about how, you know, either tell, tell how QS supports applicants on their journey or what other tips you want to give to applicants before we wrap it up for today? 
I'll, I'll say my my biggest um, my biggest tip to everybody out there listening is like yield the opportunity. It, it's great that you want to go to the top five schools. We all know who's on that list. Talk to everybody. F the rankings are a great thing and they're the worst thing. I mean, find the <laughs> university that fits you best. Yes. Find the university that's going to get you to that happy job that you wake up and you're happy to go to work. You enjoy where you are in the world. It can get you to the part of the country in the world that you want to be into and yield that opportunity. I mean, get in there and, and talk to everybody. Get to those people that you want to, but th those mid-sized universities, maybe something you never heard of. Uh, maybe it's, it's in Italy and, and you're, you're from Texas and never even left the country. Like, talk to them. You may have an amazing adventure ahead of you, an amazing experience. So but that's what we said before, what Kaylin was saying, right? There, we are here as representatives of the university looking to talk to as many. We don't want to sit there and play on our iPhone, right? We want to be able to talk to you. So yield those opportunities to talk to those um, admissions representatives, ask your questions, have your conversations. Um, you might end up in a path and a place that you you never expected and never thought of. And it could all be used, uh, given to that two minute conversation while you're standing in line. Um, so that's my biggest advice for you as for US students. And obviously come to the QS events. <laughs> I'll add one piece of event, uh, advice on that is no time is a perfect time. I think that's a very key for these events is when you register, show up because, yeah, maybe you're saying, oh, maybe I'll do it next season. Maybe I'll do it next fire. Um, no time is perfect. So just being able to jump in and start having those conversations. Um, I think we all know that the older you get, the quicker the years go. Um, so definitely taking right now, taking that time, making that leap is definitely very important. Um, and again, no time is perfect. I mean, that's just great life advice and how to not procrastinate, at, procrastinate to make the most out of a thing called life, not getting all philosophical. Um, guys from QS, both Galen and Ben, so cool to chat with you tonight. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, Barrett and Kritika, and for everyone in the audience who joined us tonight. Uh, it's going to wrap it up for today, but be sure to join us next week on MBA Waves, where we'll be jumping into another exciting topic all about business and education. See you next week. Bye. Thank you.